people hate becoming me. I am so excited to introduce you to my warrior friend, Brandy. Brandy, welcome to becoming me. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be a part of this journey with you. Oh my goodness. I am honored to just connect with you. We are social media friends and you're one of those special people that I just DM'd and said, Hey, I see your story online. Could you please share with becoming me.tv? And so truly, I am just excited to go through your becoming story today to just go on your journey. And thank you for sharing. Um, but, you know, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. And there's gonna be people watching right now who are like, who's Brandy? I don't know Brandy. I haven't followed her on Instagram yet. So just who is Brandy? Um, well, that's it seems like a loaded question, right? When we're trying to uh, lean into God's identity for ourselves. But uh, for me, I am a woman who is constantly amazed at how God is living out the 50 20 promise through Genesis 50 20 promise through all of the women that I am in those mm -hmm. sacred spaces with. So, um, restoring and redeeming, and then also that transition of being able to save lives through each and every one of our stories. Uh, that's that's really who I am. I'm also a, a daughter of God who, um, you know, has been living and residing in my father's house for so long now. Uh, I didn't grow up a Christian. I didn't grow up with God per se, mm -hmm. uh, but I found him along the way and have been trying to reside in his house in, in that mm -hmm. restful peace place for so long. Wow. I love it. And, you know, one of my... Um... I resonate with you on everything that you just shared and on a totally different level. I think one of the things that really just drew me to you was your love of hats. Girl, you and I share a love of hats. And, and y'all, before we recorded her story today, I think we probably talked for five minutes on hats. Like, ah, I love it. So you guys, you have to check out Brandy's Instagram to just see all of your amazing hats. They're beautiful. Love hats. It's a thing. Yes, it is a it's thing. A thing. It's good. Nobody knows. It's funny. I have uh, clients that I saw, I was wearing hats every single time. It was months that went by. And one day I had a really good volume day. So I didn't wear a hat and they were like, oh, we thought your head looked funny under there, but you don't have like a strange shape head or anything. And I'm like, oh, all these years you've thought that I had a funny shaped head and that's why I was wearing hats. But no, it's, it's a completely normal head. I just had really good volume that day. I just got my hair done. So girl, you know, you got to rock the good volume days, but like the hat days, right. you can never go wrong with a good hat day. So I'm a fan. Yeah. Just had to highlight that, you know, well, Hey, you know, I've alluded to, and even as you introduced yourself, um, I've alluded to your story and you have a powerful becoming journey. So I would love for you right now to just take some time and unpack your story. What's made you who you are today? Sure. So um, who I am today. So one of the things that I think that God instilled in me uh, at the very beginning of really becoming a Christian is that he didn't want my identity tied to necessarily anything. Mm -hmm. And um, you probably saw in my email when I sent it to you, there's like 15 different titles on there, or I might have erased some of them. Um, I, I'm in a lot of sacred spaces mm -hmm. with what I do professionally. And I mean, uh, a lot of places that a lot, a lot of rooms that a lot of people don't get into. And I don't take that lightly. And I get to see a lot of like pure life transformation mm -hmm. right in front of me and being able to coach people through that life transformation. And, um, it's where God has me now, but I, I did mention that I didn't grow up a Christian. Right. So uh, when I was growing up, um, the word princess, like to be the daughter of a king, was one of the worst cuss words that you could mm -hmm. say or how dare you assume that you were a princess. Now it wasn't, my mom had, like my mom was incredibly loving, but my dad, he made it very clear that I was not wanted. Mm -hmm. I was not something that, I was something, I wasn't someone who he, he loved and adored like my heavenly father does. So I did not grow up believing that mm -hmm. I had a space with God or that I could even be at the table um, and, uh, there were a lot of other things that were going on in our family. So we had really radical, um, Jehovah's witnesses on one side, extremely like we were never, ever going to be good enough for them. And then we had pagans on the other side. And then my dad for one summer believed he was a shape-shifting shaman. I mean, there were a lot of like strange ideas going on. And I, all I knew is that I, I wasn't going to be mean to people and force them to be something. So I just assumed that meant that I was a pagan. So mm -hmm. I honestly thought that, you know, I was the tree hugger. I was the person who had an altar in their apartment. There were a lot of very, 
very strange things going on around me um, that I that I didn't understand. Also, didn't know anything about, but I didn't care. I just knew I wasn't going to force somebody down a road like we what we were trying to be forced when we were younger. Um, mm-hmm. You know, uh, we were going to be disowned if unless yeah. we did this. We like it was always very apparent that mm-hmm. um, all of the cousins who had become a part of that religion. They got the nice houses, they got horses, they got lessons, they got all of the stuff, and we had a dirt floor. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was a very, very big difference. And so I grew up that way, not believing that, not even, like, I, did I believe there was a God? Yeah, I thought there was a God. I mean, every once in a while I prayed, but it was, it was always, it was always 100% out of fear over something mm-hmm. that I had done or thought that I had done that was wrong. And it was, it was not, um, it was not with the right heart, I would say. It was just, it was because I was trying to compensate for something else that I had done. Or maybe, maybe, maybe I sinned, but I wasn't sure because I didn't know what sin was. Yeah. <laughs> Except for in this like odd space. So I grew up not believing that I was a, a kid of the king. Yeah. So I I had had uh, multiple times. I had I was part of a business team. I remember um, and I'll I'll I'm not going to skip forward because I do want to share this as part of my story later, but um, I can remember being a part of a business team and that's actually how I became a Christian. And there were like six different altar calls over the course of 18 months. And the whole time I felt this like heavy weight on my shoulders, like you're not good enough. Like, Mm. you know what you've done. We know what you've done, but I, you know, I just thought I, I, there was just so much weight. I just couldn't get up. Mm -hmm. And I remember the day that I was saved, I cried for like three days solid, just like, absolutely. I couldn't believe, like I was a completely different person in that moment. And, um, I've had so many friends ask me like, well, we didn't go through that. What is that like? And I said, like, the only thing I can tell you is that it's clean. Mm -hmm. I don't know any other word to describe it it's not like a clean slate. It's, it's just, it's clean. Mm. And for so many years, I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't care. It was all about, um, me or the universe or whatever it was that was going on, whatever people were feeding to me, Mm -hmm. because I didn't know, I just knew I wasn't this one thing. And it turns out (laughs) I am that one thing, except for I'm, I'm different in the way that my approach, I I didn't understand the difference between relationship and religion. Mm -hmm. And I, I tossed out religion and then I took on relationship and the relationship Mm -hmm. with the Holy spirit, um, like gung ho and just started trying to listen to him on a daily basis and hear what he was guiding me to do. And I was I, like, even, even in the last couple of years, I had a friend that called me and she was like, you look like you're doing a lot of stuff and it all seems like it's, it's all working out, but can you just stick to one thing? And I was like, I'm not doing like, I'm not trying stuff. I'm just doing whatever God tells me. I know it's going to look weird to the world, but I'm yeah. out here doing all of these different things. Like, are you on social media? Now I am. I, I would say, no, I'm absolutely not going to be on social media. And then God's like, <laughs> Guess what you're doing now? Not only are you on social media, but you're building a social media division of your company. And it's like, anytime I say I'm not going to do something, I said at church, I will do anything for Jesus, but I will not sing in front of a million people. The next week I had written a parody that I sang and over a million people saw. And it was, it was hysterical, but it's funny because everybody that was involved with it were, they were all pastors at other churches, they were you know, uh, and the youth group leaders and all of these things. We had a music video. It was a Lizzo song. I'm like, who, like, who is this person? So I can tell you that like, no matter what, like, as far as my story is now, it's like, like, whatever God says, that's what we're going to do. Like that's, that's what we're going to do because we know that through that, there's something that I, I believe in strongly. It's called the redemptive calling and God promises it. And it's, it's Genesis 50, 20. It's People do things to hurt you, right? But God turns those things for good. He turns absolutely everything for good. And, um, and that's what I'm talking about, like watching other women live out their redemptive callings and seeing like someone called them ugly and now they're on TV. You know, someone tried to take away their, their stuffed animals and now they have a stuffed animal company. Like I have seen these strangest mm-hmm. things happen. And, and even for myself, when I was a little girl, I was told I was too ugly to be on camera. Like I was too mm-hmm. ugly to be in the family pictures when I was four. And I'm an on-camera image expert teaching and training thousands of people that they are more, more than beautiful enough to be on camera on a daily basis. It's like, 
ha ha. You know, like the, who's the joke yeah. on there? Yeah. Is, is it on the person that allowed the enemy to mm. be able to, to try to take life instead of breathing life into? Mm. Um, so that is, that's kind of my story in a nutshell. Um, yeah. And I know you have other questions, I am sure. <laughs> Well, I mean, first, thank you for unpacking your journey and your story. And it's so powerful. And I love, like, absolutely love how something that somebody, either somebody or a circumstance tries to stamp on you, that redemptive, like nature that you're speaking out and, and we don't have to live according to whatever anybody tries to define us as it's only who God defines us. Um, you know, yeah we were sharing a little bit and I know there's a chapter in your story where I think even this redemption piece really resonates, really hits home. Um, and if you're willing, and this is the space, I would love for you to unpack it. Um, because I think that there is a piece and an element in your story that one, not many people talk about, but two more people experience, um, than we would even realize. And we're walking by people who are not sharing stuff that they've walked through. They're stuffing it down, or they might not even realize they walked through it because they're thinking, Oh, that, that didn't happen to me. Um, but there's redemption in this. And so if this is an appropriate time and space, I'd be honored for you to share that chapter of your story. Yeah, absolutely. So, and I refer to it, especially when, when I'm working with clients, we're going through like personal branding or any, any of the things really it's, it's a, it's a roadblock. It's one of the yep. five major roadblocks that I usually walk people through. And it's, I call it hidden trauma hmm. and it's, um, hidden trauma is, Oh, I think it's the place where God cries the most. Hmm. I, I really do. Um, because hidden trauma, we, we, something happens to us. And for me, um, it happened when I was 19, there's a lot of stuff that happened, but my dad had just passed away. My dad, mm -hmm. um, we did not have a good relationship. We didn't have a relationship. Mm -hmm. He passed away when I was 18. I never, um, I felt more relief in his passing. And I had some guilt and shame about that. Yeah. Right. So I did turn to a couple of other vices and one of those was drinking. I wasn't drinking a lot, but I was 19 at the time. Mm -hmm. And I remember I, um, my, a friend of mine and I, we were actually, we were skating downtown and whenever we were, would need to blow off steam, we were in college. We were both working like 50 to 70 hours a week, depending upon the week I was running like multi-million dollar fashion shows as an, as an 18, wow. 19, 20 year old, which is crazy to me now when I think about it, but it, it's what I was doing. And, um, so I was also in school full time and we were, we were skating downtown, not a big deal, but we ended up meeting these guys. And, um, I, we gave our phone numbers to them and you're like, whatever. I mean, you, you meet people in college, you hand out phone numbers. It's not like, it's not like, it's not like we were texting or anything. We, we didn't, texting wasn't a thing. Um, at the time, this is, you know, 20 some odd years ago, more than 22, <laughs> over 20 years ago. Right. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'd apologize for the animation, but that's just who I am. Thanks. That's part of, part of my identity. But anyway, so so we we met these guys and I went on a date with one of them and it wasn't like that big of a deal, but I was like, I'm not going on another date with this guy. Like I'm, I'm just not. Mm -hmm. And um, I found out that he was friends with a, another group of friends of mine that I, one of the girls I worked with. And I was like, oh, okay, we'll just go out as a group. It'll be okay. And um, we went out to a bar. I used a fake ID. Oh my gosh. Yes, my mom's going to listen to this. I used a fake ID and I was 19 and mm -hmm. I had one drink and I did, I only drank like half of it and I got extremely sick. Mm -hmm. um, I was like, I, so everybody walked back to my friend's apartment and I honestly, I remember falling asleep on the couch. That's what mm -hmm. I remember. I remember falling asleep on the couch. Um, but I woke up about 24 hours later in someone else's house. And there were a lot of people there. Hmm. Um, I mean, a lot of people, there were, there were several men there. There were lots of other women. Nobody had clothes on. It was, um, it was terrifying. It was absolutely terrifying. And, um, so I, I know, I knew from that hmm. point, like I, like I was in shock, I was able to escape and I, I, I did what anybody else in, who's in shock would do that. They would, I went home, I got cleaned up and I went to work. I went to work and I mean, I was, it was in the, uh, the end of summer. I was wearing a mm. turtleneck and long pants because I had been absolutely beaten. And, mm. um, I remember going into work and seeing one of the friends that actually was there that night. And I, I was talking to her and she was like, well, what happened to you last night? And I was like, I have no idea. 
I don't know what happened, but I know I'm here right now. And I know that like, I'm just terrified. And she, I remember her putting her arms like on my shoulders and being like, Brandy, I think, I think you were raped. Mm. And I was like, I remember just that crushing feeling of being like, I know that's what happened, but I don't want to hear that right now. I'm at work Mm -hmm. and I have stuff that needs to get done. Mm. And, um, and I, she told me more about what happened that night. I like, I'm actually the one that was adamant about driving. I drove my car that night. I drove Mm. my car. Like he had made it look like he was going to take me back to my house. Mm. That's not what happened. I was actually, I I drove to a different place in town Mm. and that was that whatever drug that I was on, that was what they, that's what they gave me. And, um, the reason why I was able to escape was because they forgot a dose of drugs. And, um, it's just, it's crazy thinking back, but that was like where God reached in. And I remember almost running over a person leaving and they were Mm. like, you can't let her leave. There were a lot of guns involved, but they didn't want to kill me. Um, it was, it was really, it was horrible. It was horrible. But in my mind, I was like, that didn't happen. Mm. And I just tucked it in. I packed it away and I never talked about it. I mean, I, I did talk about it light, later. It was years later. I didn't, I didn't really tell anybody about it mm-hmm. until um, my husband and I, our relationship got serious. And then I, I thought like, well, he's got to know because he's got to know he's my husband and, or he'll be my husband. But mm-hmm. I mean, we hadn't, he hadn't, he still proposed and we're married. We've been married for 15 years. So, um, you know, it takes a really mm-hmm. strong man of God to be able to take on that, mm-hmm. I will say. Um, but it wasn't until years and years later, um, I'd, I'd had my daughter, she is now eight years old. And this is why I I talk about hidden trauma so much specifically is because of this story. Mm -hmm. So the, the type of trauma that you have, it doesn't have a size. It doesn't have an amount. It has a taxing effect on you. And the, the traumas that we actually talk about have less of an effect because we own them. It's when we put them down on the inside and act as though they never happened, which if you looked at the outside of my life, I quit my job because they knew where I worked. Mm. I quit school because they knew where I went to school and I moved because they knew I lived with my parents and I didn't want my parents getting in trouble. Like I didn't want anybody going after my family. So I moved, quit school and quit my job. So, and at that time, I mean, I was 18, 19, or I was 19 at that point. I was making well into six figures with what I was doing. No kid should have that amount of money. But I was like, I, I quit everything and I lived in an apartment and I just completely isolated. Hmm. And, um, and, and then I came back out later because I, I, I ended up, uh, I became suicidal also through all of that. I was drinking like two bottles of champagne every morning. I mean, it was, it was bad. It was, it was a bad scenario. Um, I, when I became suicidal, I actually, um, I remember counting out pills. Like I was Mm -hmm. counting out pills. Keep in mind, I had acted like this hadn't happened. So I didn't know why Mm -hmm. it was like a a year later. I didn't know why I was struggling with depression and anxiety so much. And it's because I was, wasn't dealing with what, what I wasn't acting like even happened right? Yeah. It's like, how do you, how do you go to the police if it didn't happen? Um, you know, how do, do am I going to get in trouble if I do go to the police? What happens? Mm-hmm. Um, all of the things. So, so hiding that, hiding that trauma down in there. Um, it wasn't until I had my daughter and, um, some other traumas kind of popped up after childbirth. Mm. Um, we had problems with nursing. It wasn't related in any way, shape or form to, to that specific instance. Mm-hmm. But when you don't deal with something, for so long, it comes to a head when you least expect it. Mm. And so I remember it was a year later, my daughter, it was, her, it was on her very first birthday that I was, uh, that I was diagnosed with complex post-traumatic stress disorder. Mm. And I was recommended for like inpatient housing. They're like, we really don't want you at home with your family right now. We, mm. we need to take you out of that scenario so you can deal with this. And I was like, my husband travels for work. I'm a new mom. It's not going to happen. So what other programs do you have? Mm. <laughs> like, what else do you have? And quite honestly, like I'd gone through my whole adult life, um, doing all of these things, being in all of these sacred spaces, listening to the voice of God, doing all of the things that he was Mm. saying to do. And it wasn't until then that he was like, it's time to go through this, Mm. you know, and just like now years later, eight years later, seven years later, he's like, it's time for the secrets of the past to be told so you can save other people. 
And that's what we're doing today. Yeah. But the thing is, I was, I remember being in therapy and I was in therapy for 18 months Mm -hmm. and it was, it was, (laughs) it was pretty intense. There was a lot of homework. There was a lot of stuff going on. Um, I had to uncover lots of different things because there was a lot of trauma from my childhood, a lot of trauma from um, being a teenager, just, just a lot of trauma. And none of it was like, um, if it, if it could have been bad and it could happen to a woman, Hmm. it happened to me. And I I don't mean to sugarcoat that, but, but another promise that God gives is that without a trace of smoke, right? Where, where we can get mm-hmm. out of the furnace without a trace of smoke. And so that's how I have been choosing mm. to live my life up until this point. So now people will know that this is part of my story. Yeah. Um, and I'm okay with that. The thing is, is that I know that it's part of at least 20% of the other women's story that are probably yeah. listening to this. Yeah. And when we hide these things, they do come to a head. And for me, it was mm-hmm. uh, like, I had you know, casually dealt with the fact like, yeah, I've been raped, Mm. but yeah, like that's, that's a part of my story, but it wasn't until months later in therapy where I I had been, you know, serving on a a 21 project and like running the walk in Indianapolis and making sure that everybody knew about sex trafficking and all of these things. And it wasn't until I was sitting across from the therapist who had helped other people through the exact same thing. And she, and I was coaching people on how to identify sex trafficking But it was, she just said, why do you think God keeps calling you to these places? Hmm. Like, why do you think God keeps calling you to the places where women are specifically being trafficked? And I was like, I don't know. And she was like, tell me the story again. And I told her the story and I still like, it was, it was a few months later until I was writing the book. And I was like, oh my gosh, I was being trafficked. And in, in that moment, it was like, knowing that God reaching in and grabbing me out of that, I should not have been able to escape. Like Mm. there, there's no way I shouldn't have been able to escape. Um, Mm. I found out through that same therapist that there's a certain type of drug that they were using at the time. in those instances that made you um, incredibly strong and you could fight people off of you, which is what was happening on my way out the door. There were at least three men that I fought off of me that were trying to stop me. And, um, but, but I'm like, God had to remind me of those things. And then finally it's, it's the, the redemptive calling, like God can restore and redeem so much, right. Without us coming to grips with saying, yes, this happened to me. Like I'm helping out with all of these other foundations that help with trafficking. I'm, I'm helping people survive. I'm helping with rescues. I'm helping raise money. I'm doing all of this stuff. And I'm still helping and God's restoring and redeeming, but he wasn't able to restore and redeem me fully because I didn't own it. And that's Mm. the thing. It's like our stories, they all belong to God, but we can't hand over what we don't own. Like we, if it's not in our hands and we don't take it on and say, this is ours, we can't give it back to him and say, do your will with this. And let's, let's go. Genesis 50, 20, the crap out of this story together. Like, let me hear your voice more clearly so that I can affect every person that you want me to affect. Mm. Let me, let me coach other women how to hear your voice more clearly so I can help her get back everything that was stolen. And it's, it's funny because I was helping other women, but I was capped off and Mm. I was like, nope, I'm good. I'm good. I'm over here. You know, like we'll, we'll deal with that sometime. And God's like, no, we're Brandy. We're dealing with this right now. Wow. Wow. That's, I mean, thank you for unpacking. Um, and I love how you just shared, like, we have to own our story and we have to hold it. And that's the only way that we can truly find freedom and giving it back to God. Um, and you mentioned you wrote a book. So you wrote a book about this story. Is it already out or is it in the future? I, I did. I wrote, I, I wrote a book in 2019 and there were, I think six publishers that were interested in it at the time that God was like, hold it. There's another one. And then we had COVID, but okay. this particular book was actually about, um, the, the main roadblocks that I okay. work with, with clients and personal branding. Okay. So like all of my on-camera talent, things along okay. those lines. Um, I, I don't know if this would probably be in my bio, but I primarily work with people who are on the Forbes list and people who are at higher up level media and celebrities through personal branding. And there's five mm-hmm. major roadblocks and that is one of them. Okay. Um, it's very consistent that I see, uh, that I see, and I can, you know, I'm, God has attuned my spirit to be able to pick on up on that when the sexual tra- trauma piece of that specifically, yeah. 
I can walk into a woman's closet and I can tell you if it's happened. Like I just, I know wow. by what they're wearing and it's part of it. That's what that book is about. So wow. That's, that's powerful. not the first one that'll be published though. <laughs> oh, I believe it. girl. I see so many books and just resources and stories. Um, so, you know, so many questions and directions I could take, but first, before yeah. we go there, um, I'm going to ask you just a lighter question. Sure. Are you a coffee drinker? I've already discovered we are on the same page with hats. So now I got to know about coffee before we dive into this next question. I was a coffee drinker. <laughs> that's a, that's another, another thing that's been stolen from me. Um, I actually, I survived mold toxicity back in 2012 when I lived in production housing. So uh, my coffee is a big no, no, cause it's a high mold carrier. <laughs> Girl, I no. it but yeah. Oh, do you drink tea or like, what's your favorite thing to drink? Water. Is, okay. That's I all I you. got. So you're super healthy. You know, healthy. those things have been all stolen. Good. So I'm expecting them back. <laughs> Come on. You know, we, we're owning like, this part. We're claiming it. Jesus, take the wheel. Let's go. Okay. So you're having a cup of water and you're talking with somebody else on their own becoming journey. What would you say to encourage them to be who God made them to be? Um, I would encourage them to, to lean in and lay it all out on the table and just ask God to continually search your heart. And you can ask him, I mean, and I've asked him, I've asked him, you know, what, what is, what am I not seeing that has been stolen from me that you intend to redeem or you're redeeming so that I can recognize it so that I can see it in other people. So it's, it's that, that relationship of, you know, you are talking with your heavenly father. He is your daddy. Like he's your daddy. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how horrible your dad was. It doesn't matter how many times, like for me, I mean, it's like dad trying to kill me on a repetitive mm. basis. So it's like, it doesn't matter what that relationship was like. You are in now in a, a, a relationship with your heavenly father and you yeah. can ask him anything you want to, and you can journal it out and you can just let God breathe into you and let God speak into you as often as you want. It's not like eh, one time a day, all day long, if you want. I mean, I have the most wonderful conversations with God and mm -hmm. I, I would ask her to lean in mm -hmm. so that she can start having those wonderful mm -hmm. conversations and know exactly what she's supposed to be doing with her life. And so we can mm -hmm. show her her gifts and talents, show her mm -hmm. what's been stolen, show her her strongholds and be able to reveal that to her in a loving space so that she can repent and take care of those things. Mm, that's powerful. I love that question too. Like, show me what I'm not seeing God, because that's so much of our redemptive journeys. We can't own it and claim it if we don't see it. And God awakening us to the things that we've shoved down, no matter how big, small, how long ago, how recent, um, it's that invitation yeah. to freedom for sure. Yeah. So that we can step out confidently. I mean, yes. that's, that's the whole point, really. Yeah, it's so true. You know, Brandy, is there anything else that you would want to share with a warrior friend um, before we get to how people can connect with you online? Sure. I would, I would say um, whatever whatever you're doing on your journey right now, don't stop. Hmm. Just because you hear a message um, from, from me or from someone else doesn't mean that you stop dead in your tracks and then get onto a different path. Your God already has you on a path. Stay hmm. on that path until he tells you to change your path. Yeah. Because it's, you, and it, sometimes you think you're on the right path for you know, a really long time. Well, I've been doing this for so long. And that's when he's like, okay, well, I don't want your identity attached to that anymore. Mm -hmm. So we're going to turn. Yeah. And, um, so whether it's through my story or through someone else's, um, it's work through it with God. Don't yeah. do it alone. And, and if you need therapy, like, like I did, yeah. you can find a therapist that also believes in God that can help right. guide you. Right. Oh, that's so powerful. Um, thank you for unpacking your journey and your story, who you are, who you're becoming. You know, if somebody was watching and they were like, I want to learn more from Brandy. I want to check out her resources. Where can people connect with you online? Sure. I am at confidentlyco.com. And then I have, we have two different Instagrams. I know we, we uh, hit Instagram pretty hard, but it's a uh, Brandy Price image and then also uh, Confidently Company. So those are the two, uh, and, and they're, they're two different things. Um, that's kind of uh, more of the regular confidence and then the God journey is on the other side. So there's, there's two. So which, whichever one you choose, one's a little bit more lighthearted. The other one gets more deep into the word. 
Gotcha. No, that's awesome. And y'all, we will have all the links. You can easily click them, connect with Brandy, but thank you so much for sharing your journey, your story. You are a gift. Um, and it's just, it's a joy to watch how you're leveraging your life. So people can discover no matter what we faced, we have hope in Jesus and we can walk forward confidently and help other people. So thank you, Brandy. You're amazing. Thank you for having me.